Oh, ho, ho, friends, I have a great show for you today. I have a dear friend who I love so much, Becca Davy, and we are going to talk about her time inside a prison and out. So I want you to listen in, get comfortable, grab a cup of coffee, and turn it up so you can hear it all. This is Women's Hot Topics with Sugbury, and I'm so glad that you guys are here. Becca, welcome to the show. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Becca, for our listeners, so they know you as well as I do. Well, my name is Becca. Um, I'm from Minnesota, and um, I have been part of this ministry now for a little over four years. And uh, it's just, it's been a, a world of difference for me. It's been a world of difference for my family, and uh, I'm just, I'm just loving it. Yeah. And now, how many jobs? You have one job, right? I have one job, yes. And, and how many dogs do you have? Because I'm a dog lover. <laughs> we have two. Um, I have a little Shih Tzu, Aggie. And then uh, we also have a uh, Sheltie named Tilly, which is actually technically my dad's uh, emotional support dog. Oh, sweet, sweet. And I know that your dad has been battling with some illnesses. So hello, dad. We're shouting out to you and we're praying for you that you will be healed and feel better. Uh, Becca, okay. So share with our listeners, if you would, how you and I first met? Um, I first met when I was incarcerated uh, four years ago. Um, actually, probably going on five years ago because um, I got out in April 30th of 2020, right in the middle of the start of the pandemic. Mm. And you were able to still come in um, before the pandemic started. You were still able to come into our facility and um, hold church services. Yeah, And it was so important to me to be able to do that, um, to be able to just, to be able to fill me up and um, the the speakers that you brought in, the, the people that you brought in to just um, give me hope that um, there were people out there that could make it on the outside. It gave um, you hope. Mm -hmm. It did. It gave me hope. And then just being able to connect with you, I just felt the connection when I, I met you. Right away. Felt yes. it right away. Yes. And I'm just blessed for that. Blessed for that. Yes. So what events led up to you becoming incarcerated? So basically, um, alcohol. And um, what happened is back in 2016, I got um, a DUI and a refusal to submit to a chemical test after getting pulled over. And after spending numerous times in treatment, um, even going through Teen Challenge, um, working for them, I just, I was lost. Um, I kind of had given up on society. I would kind of given up on me, uh, my family, my parents. I'm an only child, um, but my family had given up on me. And when it came time for me to go back to court um, after screwing up, and breaking probation, I had begged the judge that I needed emotional, um, emotional help and mental help. And they basically said, nope, you're going back to treatment. And I said, it's either treatment or prison. And I chose prison because- Now, why did you choose that? Well, one, I had an attorney who said, oh, you can do all this stuff in prison. You can become a cosmetologist. You can get all this mental and emotional help. And uh, I believed her. And so, but the judge basically just wanted to either keep me in jail or send me to another treatment program. And I knew that's not what I needed. Mm -hmm. I needed, well, one, I needed God again. And then um, I needed to be able to fix the inside of me, not, you know, get me dry. I mean, I could do that simple. Um, but I needed, I needed to be, I basically needed a good swift kick in the butt. And uh, uh, you had mentioned you went to other treatment programs. What do you mm -hmm. think happened? Why those didn't work? Because I didn't let them work. Mm. I mean, Teen Challenge worked. I mean, I was, you know, I did that back in 2010 and um, I did it. I was good until um, 2015 when I just, I had some um, trauma happen and I basically just gave up because um, mm -hmm. I couldn't find the correct, I couldn't find the right help. Sure. And um, after that, it was just nobody wanted to, like, give me a chance. 
um, and find the right help for me. They just wanted to keep me in jail or they wanted to keep me going to treatment programs. In the system. It's easier in that way. System. It's a, it's an mm -hmm. automatic path. They already have it for you. Yes. Um, and Becca, you said you needed a kick in the butt. And tell me, what did prison do to do that to you? Um, well, um, basically, when I went to prison, I went at the end of November. I didn't see my parents until that following April because it, one, because it takes so long to get approved for visitors and two, because they spend the winters in Florida. So um, by the time they did get approved, they were in Florida. Mm -hmm. And so by the time they came back, it was almost the middle to the end of April. Now remind me, them. you said, how many times were you incarcerated? Two times? Well, I was only in prison once. Okay. But I've been in jail um, probably five times. Okay, Short that's stance. what I'm thinking. Yeah. The, long, the longest time I think I spent was this last time in 2018, 2017, 2018, where I spent three months. Until Why I went do you to prison. think they sent you to prison then? Probably because I asked, because I wasn't going to do another treatment program and they weren't mm -hmm. going to give me the, um, the DUI court. Mm -hmm. Nobody fought for me. That must be frustrating when you feel that nobody is fighting for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would imagine. I would imagine. So you get into prison, first time ever. What did you experience? Share with us. What is it like behind bars? Oh my goodness. Um, well, first off, I I was in for a rude awakening. There was no um, mental or emotional help. There was no um, like cosmetology program, even though there was, but you had to be incarcerated for a long time. Um, you had to and have on good behavior mm -hmm. uh, and on good behavior, but you had to have more than I think two or three years left on your sentence. And with my sentence, it was um, three years, but with good time, it was only um, 24 months or I think with Minnesota, it was like 24 months because I actually only spent 17 months incarcerated and then um, another three months at a halfway house. Mm -hmm. What ha what halfway house did you go to? Um, it was uh, Eden. Um, oh, yeah. R.S. Eden? Yep. R.S. Yep. Eden in uh, okay. St. Paul. Good. Off the university. Good. Explain to our listeners what a halfway house, what's the purpose of it? So the purpose of a halfway house is basically you're still kind of in prison, except you're able to go out and you're, work, you're able to work, you're able to get passes to visit your family. Um, however, of course, mine was at the beginning of the pandemic, so we didn't get all that. And then, of course, yeah. it was right in the middle of uh, the George Floyd stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so we even had stricter um restrictions because they couldn't afford for us to get in trouble or have police contact because technically we were still um in prison sure. and so we we were actually locked down at the halfway house except to go to work and there was a lot of um upheaval in the twin cities at that time they didn't want anybody out there at that absolutely i could completely get that well okay. we had places burned down like literally blocks away from our halfway house Man. It was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, spoke with the National Guard at that time. He said it was like Iraq and Iran burn into the ground. It was just crazy. Now, Becca, you mentioned that you were at RS Eden, and thank you for explaining what a halfway house is. Mm -hmm. um, and did you have a job while you were there? I did. And how yeah. did you get hired? Did, I mean, are people hesitant to hire felons? Actually, because it was the pandemic, um, I got a job within two weeks from Lunds and Byerly's and it was a phone every phone interview. It wasn't even really an interview. It was basically, you know, when can you start? Awesome. Do you think that would have happened had COVID not been going on? I don't think so. Yeah. Cause it, you yeah. know, I think that's the complaint most of our mentees have right now is finding a job that people will hire them or they'll say, Oh yeah, we're felon friendly. We'll hire you. Then they go work there for two to three weeks, even a month. And then they come back and they said, oh, we just did a background check. And I'm like, I went in and introduced you guys and said, you know, that she was, she had a background. And uh, so I don't know if it's, I don't know what happens, but it's crazy. I did, 
I did have that um, because obviously they didn't do the background check in the beginning. And then after um, they actually wanted, because it was temporary, actually when they actually wanted me, they did the background check and I got suspended for a month why I had to go through that. But because I was doing such a great job, I had three of my bosses to back me up. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, no, otherwise I probably would have been fired. Now, why, why suspended for a month while they were still doing a background check even because, further? Or what was that right. deal? Yeah, because why um, HR decided whether or not after I filled out the reason why mm -hmm. um, I had to answer all these questions and um, why HR decided whether or not I was worthy enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know um, what? And yeah. I, t I, I, I might have said this to you too while we were still mm -hmm. in prison. Um, and I said it to most of our ladies, and that is, you know, you are paving the way for every woman leaving prison with your attitude, with your work skills, with, and, you know, unfortunately, you got to work twice as hard as everybody else, because everybody, uh, you know, are, are quick to judge. Sadly, that's the world we live in. Right. But Becca, I have been so proud of you because you've been there for a long time. Hats off to Byerly and Lunds for your dedication um, and giving someone a second chance. Yes. Um, did you have any challenges with the employees who you worked with? Were any of them kind of judgmental if they found out that you had been incarcerated? Actually, the only time that I got um, some, um, I guess, some slack or some um, uh, feedback was in the beginning when I was still in the halfway house and I had to leave at certain times or had to, um, I could only come in at certain times and um finally had to explain to one of the newer younger managers that was only in his 20s and I finally just sat him down and I said you know I I get that you know you're having an issue but here's why and once mm -hmm. I explained to him he understood yeah. and he was like I'm so sorry key. I'm yeah. so sorry I will never you know and I said this is you know and I don't want everybody to know no you know mm -mm. so no, you're better off with my, a fresh start yeah, only my store manager and our general manager knew. And then obviously he knew, but I said, you know, yeah. this is between the three of us. Yeah, and yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you've proven to be a loyal uh, employee. Um, I want to back up just a little bit. Let's mm -hmm. bring us back into prison again before you were okay. released. So now you're in, really, you're in prison. You didn't feel like anybody was listening. There wasn't any programming that was fitting you. Is that what I heard you say? Is that correct? You Basically, came to church services. Yeah. The services were speaking to your heart, and that's God. I love how he works that way. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a great turnout. We'd be there Saturday nights. We'd get yeah. up to 200 inmates per service, and we had two mm -hmm. services. And then, of course, things happened. COVID happened. Things got mm -hmm. shut down, staffing. You know, it's a tough deal inside of prison. I mean, and, and friends, I'm just going to interject here for a, a minute, <laughs> a shameless plug we need mentors. We need people to come to him for her ministries yes. and mentor women inside of prison. And then when they're leaving prison uh, community, we need employers that have the guts to say, I'm going to give this person a second chance. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what God calls us to do. If God has blessed mm -hmm. you with a company, he's expecting you to give back. You have been blessed, blessed to be a blessing to others. Okay. I don't want to get too excited about that. You guys can find us at himforher.org. Uh, look us up. We need donations. We need help. And I could go on and on with more stories of people <laughs> that have been blessed by this ministry. Okay, Becca, you're inside a prison. Church is speaking to you. Your family, uh, it was a little rough between you guys. I remember you had told me that in the past mm -hmm. um, as far as some challenges. And so tell me. What, first of all, how did you hear about him for her and why did you even sign up? Well, first off, I had actually tried boot camp. Um, okay. Explain so, to us what that is. So boot camp, CIP, it's um, a special separate entity almost from like the actual general population. Mm -hmm. um, it's where you can get almost um, time knocked off. And, but it's almost, it's like the Marines. Um, mm -hmm. boot camp marine um, and they they basically change your life but then if you can actually succeed then you get all of your you get to get released early and you get time knocked off but then you're still in prison when you get on the outside and it's even um, stricter parole probation um, so 
I had signed up for that. I passed, I, uh, I got in. And then unfortunately, um, I lost too much weight, too much body fat. And uh, they told me that I couldn't continue. And so then mm -hmm. I got sent back to general population. Now, if I understand correctly, the amount of time that you're inside a boot camp, uh, you have to then redo back in general population. Is that correct? Um, actually, no, I did not. Um, oh, good. Okay. No, I did not because I didn't actually get kicked out for behavior mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I got mm -hmm. kicked out because I couldn't. Evidently, my body fat got so low that um, I they said I could have died, but I don't oh, technically. No. Yeah, I don't know if I believe that because it was on a human scale. Well, you know, and um, for the friends, it's like boot camp, like you're running and you're doing calisthenics and you're working and you're lifting and mm -hmm. um, everything is corners turned, bounce a quarter off the bed. I mean, everything is, mm -hmm. and it really is a great program. Uh, it's a wonderful program inside of it the is. prison. Um, you cannot communicate with others inside the prison, the general population. It's just you and your, uh, uh, do they, what do they call it? A team? Yes. It's just you and your team. You yeah, and your team. Yeah. Are together. Yeah. And so that's, you know, it has a lot of great qualities. It's not for everybody though. No, it's And not. so then um, you got released back to the general population or GP, mm -hmm. they call it. And then what happened? And then um, I was told that I still needed to complete a treatment program. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so basically I came to, came, you know, denied treatment on the outside, but came to mm -hmm. prison to still do treatment. Yeah. So, and that was for alcoholism. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so then I got moved from one building to another building, which was their treatment um, program. And that's where I really learned um, about myself. And that's where I really got the help that I, that I needed. Well, that's good though, to hear. Mm -hmm. So um, I was able to work through a lot of issues. I was able to worked through a lot of trauma that I had that um, I thought I had worked through. And because uh, they really, you had no choice but to work through it because there was nowhere else to go. It's not like I could skip group or I could skip, mm -hmm. you know, say, oh, well, you know, I don't feel like coming today. You had to go in order to be able to get released, even on work release. You had to be able to graduate. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you hear about him for her mentoring? Um, when you, um, it was on a Saturday night church service and you started mm -hmm. talking about it and you said, um, you had to have at least six months left. And I remember, I don't even think I had six months. Um, and I think I even got denied the first time. And I wrote a letter to you and saying, this is, I really need help. You know, I'm going to be released hopefully to Dakota County. I hadn't even heard that I was going to be, cause I was a Hennepin County, um, and I think I wrote a letter and um, just saying here, I really need this. And in order for me to succeed on the outside and uh, next thing I know, then I was approved. And, you know, the way it works is if somebody is denied, it's either because there's some issues that aren't in our wheelhouse that we can deal with or uh, it's too soon. Like we can't turn it around fast enough. And I, if I remember correctly, I'm the one who gives all the denials. If mm -hmm. I remember correctly, that was because I felt it was too soon. But look at mm -hmm. you stood up for yourself, Becca. And that's really what we look for. We look for people who want to turn their lives around. And then I love what God does. Then God put you together with our friend Jan. Miss Jan was your mentor. Tell me about the first time you met her. Actually, I was supposed to when I first got the, the notice that I had a mentor. It was somebody completely different. Oh, and yes. Um, I wish I would have kept that piece of paper, but yeah, it was somebody completely different. And then I believe, um, I don't know if you told me or if then someone somehow Jan showed up and I was like, this isn't the person that I was supposed to have, but it was such, it was a blessing in disguise. It was and a person that was meant to be by God. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, and so the first time I met her, her daughter was supposed to, um, have her, her first child. They had been, and she explained how she was um, so excited. And if she um, couldn't make it like for the next visit, this is why, because uh, her daughter was going to be having the baby. And uh, yeah, so 
<laughs> That's exciting. It was just, yes. And so the first, the first time we just, we talked about, you know, just about my background. We talked about her background. Um, she shared with me, you know, just some about her past. And um, then um, we prayed together and it just, the connection was just, it was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, and then we uh, started talking on the phone um, because I met her literally, I think a month prior to COVID really um, becoming, um, becoming real. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I only got, I think, was it one? I think I only got two visits with her before the prison face to locked face. down. Yeah, yep, yep. the prison locked everything down, but she kept communicating with you, correct? Yes. Yep, she we was were able writing to talk letters, on the phone, writing talking on letters. the phone. Mm -hmm. Yep, and mm -hmm. then um, as I got closer to release, she actually started communicating with my mom because that's when they locked us down and they couldn't figure out how to separate 700 women and we couldn't even use the phones. Yeah, yeah. And her and my mom actually developed a good relationship because they found out that, because they both have Shelties and they found out that they had the same breeder. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Small world. Yes. Oh, I love yes. it. I love yep. how God does that. Mm -hmm. And so you're getting ready to be released. And what were some of your fears about walking out the door? Uh, the fact that we weren't even, we didn't even know up until basically a couple hours before we were going to be released that we were going to be able to, because we weren't sure the halfway house was going to take us because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. Of COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of the COVID. Yeah. And so uh, what would a fear have been? Uh, that I was going to have to stay probably for my entire sentence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you worried about and, relapsing? Uh, at that time? No, because I had such a strong relationship. I had developed such a strong relationship with God through mm -hmm. going to your church services, through speaking with Jan, through her letters, um, through just the stuff that she wrote me just was so positive and so mm -hmm. uplifting and it just, it helped to get me through because we were locked in our rooms 24 seven until they could figure out how to separate us. Wow. And, um, you know, I had never had the entire time I was there. I had never had a TV because I didn't have the money and it was the end of January and I had saved up enough money. And I just told my mom, I said, you know, I really would like a TV. And she was like, you know, I, th I think we could do that. And oh my goodness, it was almost, that was like another God thing because if it wouldn't have been for that TV, oh my goodness, I don't know what we would have done. And because you're cooped up, no programming, you're in your room, you can't, yeah. you know, I, I, and we couldn't even come in for church services. There were yeah. no Christian services during COVID and all of that just broke my heart for you all. Mm -hmm. Was there a Bible verse that spoke to you during that time? Yep. It's uh, Romans. Romans eight, it's called life's storm buster. Oh, yeah. So it is says, uh, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Amen. You're free now, honey. I am free in Christ. I love that. And so now you get released, you meet with Jan, she gave you a hope bag, we gave you a prayer shawl, a uh, hope bag, friends, is something that has a lot of female essentials in it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, daily essentials, just to get back on your feet and such. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the cool thing is, I remember talking to your mom at one time, mm -hmm. and your mom says, I remember when Becca said, mom, I signed up for this mentorship program with him for her. And she was so shocked. She's like, what? Mm -hmm. And uh, she said that that really helped turn your life around. It did. It did. Um, my mom. So basically they wouldn't talk to me until um, the first visit in that April of 20, 2019. Um, and my dad um, still refused to come see me. He was that upset with me. Mm -hmm. um, it took another six months, I believe, before he even actually came to see me. Um, yeah. And it was still kind of touch and go um, before mm -hmm. he even um, would really kind of open up. And as he saw me 
change Gene. Um, he started opening up more and we mm -hmm. were able to talk. Yeah. He and, was guarding uh, his heart. He didn't want to get hurt again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yep. And um, what would you say, uh, you know, Jan has a lot of great qualities, but yep. she's just an everyday woman who stepped mm -hmm. forward to say, I want to get the love thing right with women leaving prison. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is your uh, favorite thing or, uh, yeah, basically the favorite thing that Jan would do with you? Um, I think just being able to call her or talk to her. Um, mm -hmm. We always met either for coffee or lunch. Um, I could talk to her about anything, even if I was struggling. Um, it's not that she took me shopping or she took me. It's not that she was someone that, um, oh, hey, will you buy me this? Or, hey, will you buy me that? It was, I really need to talk. I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. And um, she had some of her own struggles. And so she knew she could relate with me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, it was easy to be able to talk with her. And so she was a blessing for you leaving prison in the friendship and bond that you guys made. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, the first time, I, I think it was the first time I met your parents, was we had a car donated for you. And now people, I don't want you to be thinking, oh, if I join him for her ministries, I'm going to get a car. Mm -mm. But we do from time to time, if there's someone who's a hard worker, who's turning their lives around, who's already proven themselves, um, we give uh, them the opportunity to purchase a car. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't give them a car, but it's at a very minimal amount um, compared to the whole value of the car. And so we met your parents at a donut shop. My yeah. husband was so ecstatic about the donut job. Yeah, and we pulled in, we had your car for you. Mm -hmm. And I just remember your mom and dad was so proud of you. I could just mm -hmm. see it in their faces. They were so mm -hmm. happy and so proud of you and the woman that you've become and how hard you'd been working that they couldn't wait to, to watch you be blessed by this vehicle. And I still have that vehicle. It's 284,000 <laughs> miles. Oh. Yep. I love it. So friends, if you've got a car just sitting around out there and you want to donate it to our ministry, it goes for a good cause. A hundred percent is tax deductible. Um, and um, we are a 501c3 and nobody gets paid friends. Uh, everyone who volunteers, we step forward. We get the love thing right. Um, and I have one executive assistant and she's a um, contractor. Otherwise, everybody uh, does this just for the Lord, including myself. Because Why? Look at Becca. Look at her life. Her life was turned around from a combination of things. It was the Lord first. Amen. It was God's word being spoken. She went to church services. She wanted to, she realized that she needed help. She cried out for help. I love that. And also look at the journey God put her on by bringing together community. And that's what this is all about. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I think I might like to be a mentor but I have no skills and no background. And hey, listen, friends, if you are born again and believe in Jesus Christ, you are qualified and I will do the rest of the training. We have a monthly training every month with our team. Uh, we bring in uh, professionals from time to time to talk about de-escalation or safety or, you know, whatever the different conversation might be, prayer, uh, depression, you know, all sorts of things that we deal with. And um, I'm just so blessed when people step forward and say, I don't know why God's calling me to this, but I need to be here. And that's the women that we have on our team. They're just excellent. Uh, Becca, uh, you've been out now, is it five years? It, it was four years in April. Four years in April. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you get a hold of me. And what do you say you want to do now? I want to be a mentor. You want, want to get back be a mentor with him for her ministries. Why did you decide that? What came about in that? Um, basically, I started praying about it because I wanted to be able to give back the way Jan was able to give me and help me. And I wanted to be able to give someone that was coming out of prison or someone that, you know, needed. I wanted to be able to share my story and be able to share with them um, how what Jan did for me. Yeah. And encourage him. Look, at you had a great mentor to, to learn from. So she yeah. was just such a blessing to you. And so we knew that I'd be jumping through a couple of hoops because she's still what they call on paper. Um, and so I wrote to the prison and gave 
them uh, the story you shared with me that she wants to get back. She's been out this long, et cetera. And they knew you and they said, <laughs> absolutely. And big strong okay. letters, all capitals, exclamation mark. I think there might've been three of them. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> they really thought that that was such a blessing. And you know, that's real healing. Don't you think Becca, mm -hmm. when you've it been is. inside incarcerated, you come out, someone walked alongside with you in love for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you realize I want to get back and do the same thing for somebody else. So hats off to you. You have a mentor now. Uh, you, you, talked with her inside of prison she's released we're going to see how this goes you know everybody is individual and different but we will be praying for you how can we specifically be praying for you um i would say just to give me um the encouragement and um i'm hoping i pray for her every day um i haven't heard from her since she's been released but i'm doing everything i can um in order to get the word out there through even yeah. my PO. Mm -hmm. Um, cause she's as Dakota County as well as I am. Yeah. And that hopefully, you know, when she maybe gets a little bit more settled, she's only been out a week now. Yeah. And when she gets a little bit more settled, she'll reach out. But you know, it's amazing how quickly you can build that relationship. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I got to say the majority of the people we've had in our program are like you, where they're so thankful and they turned their lives around and and we're here with them in that journey. Uh, but then once in a while, you get a stray bullet there where they just are on their own. And, you know, but we can pray for them. And in scripture, it says some things can only be done through prayer. Right. And I that I mean, Jesus said that. And so just the fact to know that you are praying for an individual on the other side of the fence now who's out mm -hmm. and and God and his holy angels are watching over him. I mean, what a blessing is that? So, friends, I'm going to end it with this. First of all, Becca, I love you tremendously. I love it. I remember when I would see you in church inside of uh, prison, and I just love you tremendously. I love, I miss preaching. And I want, uh, if I could, I want every church in America to be involved in prison ministry in uh, their local prisons. Um, we have a training program. We have everything laid out. Uh, we have everything spelled out. So if you find that you do want to start this in your own um, community, reach out to us at himforher.org, H-I-M number four, her.org. Um, and we will get back to you quickly and we will talk about options that you might have and how do you get started in this. Now, if you want to be a mentor in the Twin Cities area, uh, reach out to us as well at himforher.org and uh, tell us. And remember, your qualification is you got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and we will help you with the rest. And our motto really is, Let's just get the love thing right. And I hope we did that with you, Becca. We definitely did. It's been such a blessing. So friends, Thanks. this is why we wake up in the morning. This is why we do what we do. And that is to reach out, get the love thing right, and make an impact and a difference, hopefully, for generations to come. This is Sugbury. You know I love you. Over and out.